Tired. So tired. Overtired. You're listening to Overtired. I'm Christina Warren, joined, as always, by my good friends, Jeffrey Severance Gunsel and Brett Terpstra. Boys, how are you? So good. Hello. Hi. So we are recording this a little bit later than we usually do in the week, uh, ironically, because we've all had kind of things going on and um, all of us are, if this is going to maybe be a little bit of kind of a low energy show, but not low content, uh, just because (laughs) we are all tired. Same amount of content, just slower. No, I think we got a new, that's a new like tagline, high content, low energy. (laughs) Okay. I don't hate that. I don't hate that at all. I can see the shirt. <laughs> I feel like that's a drink. <laughs> awesome. White Russian, high content, low energy. Oh man, I used to. I was never a heavy drinker, but when I was in a band and playing a lot, playing shows a lot, I realized that if I had a White Russian and two Grain Belt beers, which for non Minnesotans is just pick your piss beer, but we're yep. loyal to it. If I had that combination of drink, I would go into the show without having to stretch because I'd just be a little looser (laughs) generally. And by the time the show was over, I was no longer drunk and and, or buzzed or whatever. And I really, I got a science, it was a scientific thing, a white Russian and two (laughs) grain belt premiums. And I'd go into the show, a barrel of laughs and come out pretty sober and ready to go to sleep. Yeah. My first time in a bar, I was like, I think 17, maybe 18. And I didn't, I didn't know any drinks to order. Like I had no experience (laughs) with this and white Russian was the only drink I had ever heard of. (laughs) (laughs) That was the night I discovered there's also a black Russian and I don't remember what's in a black Russian, but I liked it better. (laughs) They make canned white Russians. I mean, they like make a lot of canned (laughs) cocktails, but there's the mental health check-in right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so should we roll into a, a mental health corner? Are sure. We, are we high enough energy to do that? Totally do that. Okay. Who wants to start? Uh, I can start. Do it, please. Um, my family had a medical emergency over the last week, and I spent some time in the um, in the hospital, in like the nicest hospital room. It was amazing. They had a wee. Oh my God. And if you wanted an Xbox or a PlayStation, you could get that instead. Wow. Um, and they had like a Blu ray player and a giant TV that was really high quality. There are actually three TVs in the room. It was the craziest thing I ever saw. Um, I know when I, when my mom was, my mom was in a coma in the ICU for a couple of weeks, two years ago, maybe three years ago. And I, the entire time she was there for two weeks, I couldn't get a folding chair. But this hospital room had a couch that turned into a bed, a recliner, <laughs> two regular chairs. It was like, I was like, wow, it's just like such a crapshoot. It's yeah. amazing. Anyway, but the Wii was kind of amazing. Um, my So it's always strange to be in and out of a hospital room over the course of a week. It definitely causes me to lose the ground from under my feet. Um, and uh, and so that's that's pretty much how I am feeling is uh, without any ground under my feet. Um, and it also is like my brain is trying to kind of figure out where to sort some hard news out of this family emergency. Um, and it's just, it's like, it feels like two things at once. It feels like my brain can't sort it, but it also feels like I know that there's a part of me that's very emotional about this. Like, but I can't, quite get through the membrane to get my hands on it. Um, and so it just feels like, like I'm at a distance from the kind of true feelings of the thing. And that always scares me a little bit because I can, I can, I'm someone who can easily get kind of disembodied where like, I feel a lot of my stress in my head, but I don't really feel anything else in the rest of my body. It's like, everything's just like, it's like so symbolically perfect because I'm in my head and, and all of the, discomfort is also in my head. And I think when I'm, when I think of settling things, settling in, I literally think of them like trickling down from my head into the rest of my body. And that's something I'm struggling with right now after just getting some hard news this week. So, so that's it. So I, 
I saw a therapist this week and I saw my psychiatrist this week and um, I have come to believe that what I, you know, how I check in as stable sometimes, but I'm fucking bored um, right. and, and not, not doing great. Like, like stable, what I've called stable has never been great for me. Um, I also saw a talk from a bipolar cartoonist this last week who came to speak at a local college. Um, and I, I realized maybe like, so there's bipolar one, bipolar two, then there's this other thing that starts with CYCL, cyclothemia or something like that. And I realized that might be me. Like I might not be bipolar two as I had always assumed, I may be this thing that alternates between hypomania and depression in rapid succession and never sees like a real stable in between. So what okay. I've always called stable might be depression. And like, so my new goal after talking to psychiatrists and therapists is to find out what stable actually can be. And like to reframe, like I've always been scared of finding stability because in my experience, stability had been something just infinitely boring and without any creative uh, or productivity, like just not the way I wanted to live. Uh, but that might be depression for me. And mm. I might be able to find a stable where I'm actually happy, where I experience like normal human happiness, not like manic euphoria, just like uh, an interest in doing like going for a hike, going for uh, a good dinner um, and really finding pleasure in those things without having to be manic. Um, and so mm. that's kind of that's rocked my worldview if you will um, <laughs> right to to realize maybe there's something that i haven't experienced that i could strive for uh so we started looking into ways that i can uh reach that stability uh without losing all of the things i love about hypomania uh without mm. losing my creativity my my drive to create new things um, to maybe find that and be stable because this, this bipolar cartoonist, um, I would have to look up her name. Hold, give me one second. Uh, okay. edit. Um, she wrote a book called marbles and one called rock steady. And her name is Ellen Forney. Um, and she was she was an excellent presenter. It was like going. Do you guys know who the bloggist is? Mm -mm. No. Um, she is a, uh, a blogger who is I can't remember exactly what her neurodivergence is, but her level of anxiety and uh, sarcasm <laughs> combines to make really amazing. Like she's written a couple books uh, and. And she has always spoken to me as as a neurodivergent person. But uh, Ellen Forney, like really when she presented, uh, she did it so humbly uh, while basically saying, like, I have suffered through uh, extreme mania and extreme depression. And I have come out as this. This is what I've produced. This is what I've learned from the process. And it was. I cried a little listening to her just because I related and I could feel like the pain of what she had gone through and, and the fact that she had come out on the other end and had found stability and had been able to continue creating as a stable person was like joyous to me. And it's given me something new to strive for. Awesome. That's really great. I feel like you're you're in the there's this whole category of experience when something changes in your life or when or when something is removed um either by choice or or not and you ask yourself the question what am I without x yeah. right mm -hmm. yeah and it seems like you've been you've been asking that question and what you just described sounds like it's like a pathway to an answer which is awesome 
Yeah, my therapist described it as like, so you're sitting in a room and your mania is sitting in this chair and your depression is sitting in this chair and they are your old friends. Like you, <laughs> you need to choose whether you're going to say goodbye to them or whether you're going to manage them or like how you're going to define this relationship with these external beings. And that, that kind of rang true for me, like this idea that my mania was almost this external thing that I associated with, that I related to, uh, that I, I wanted in my life. Uh, so I, yeah, I have some shit to figure out, uh, as far as this relationship goes with my bipolar. Um, but yeah, this new idea of maybe happiness and stability that could be, that could be cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's, I think that could be amazing actually. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> All right. So for me, mine, um, I mean, I've been, so I, I was hosting uh, Microsoft Ignite this week and we might talk a little bit about some of the stuff that was announced there. Cause some of it was, was actually interesting. A lot of it is just like enterprisey kind of stuff that'll appeal to a certain segment of our audience, but not most of it. But, um, but that was, it was, it was fun. I haven't, um, done, um, a hosting thing like with Microsoft since I left Microsoft and, um, cool. you know, I'm, 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 I'm still, you know, part of kind of like the the family, so to speak. But you know, I work at GitHub, and so I'm doing GitHub Universe next month, which uh, November 9th and 10th in uh, uh, San Francisco. So if you are there and you see me, obviously say hello. Uh, we awesome. have a rule on a Rocket where if we see listeners in real life, I buy them a drink. But that also applies to overtired listeners, and it does not need to be an alcoholic drink. I'll buy you, you know, a smoothie <laughs> or coffee or whatever the case may be. Um, but, uh, just throwing that out there, I'm very low probability that anyone who listens to this podcast will be at GitHub universe, but you never know. Um, also, uh, register and join us online for free. That's end of my plugging. And, um, <laughs> so, but no, but I was doing that and it was, it was fun, but it was also kind of weird. I was like kind of back, you know, in this, in this world a little bit that I hadn't been in. And, um, I had been a little bit disconnected from a lot of the process of actually, uh, you know, kind of the, the day-to-day stuff of like, I didn't really know what content was going to be involved and I wasn't super involved in the script writing. And so I really was kind of like hired talent who wasn't, you know, paid. Um, the, the mm-hmm. guy that, um, so we had, it was a hybrid event. So there were people in, um, Seattle at the Seattle convention center, which is incidentally like a five or six minute walk from my apartment. Uh, I had to go, you know, half an hour away to Redmond, the Microsoft campus, the studios to record there, but we did have a bunch of people, in person doing stuff. Um, and then there were some local events happening at the same time in, in various parts of the world. Uh, but it was me and this guy, Brian Tong, who's a, a YouTuber. He used to work at CNET and now he has his own YouTube channel and he's an independent guy. We were the two people hosting from, um, uh, main studios and we had, we did some interviews and some other stuff, but a lot of it was just kind of introducing packages and going to the next, you know, bits of segments and things like that. But, um, it was fun. I, I got to see some people um, who came out, you know, for the event in person at, at um, like kind of a community kind of meetup thing that was in my neighborhood. Um, I was not able to go in person to see anything because I was too far away and I was literally on air the whole time that everything was happening. But it was uh, my mental health is is good, I guess. It was it was it was weird, though. It was like, you know, you go back and it's almost like, you know, when you go back and you like visit like a school after you graduated or left and you see, you know, people. And I certainly like, it wasn't the same thing because I was still like doing, you know, a job and was, was hosting and whatnot. But, you know, it's, it's like not my, my life anymore, really. Right. Like it might be for a couple weeks out of the year, but you know, I, I was coming in, you know, as, it's kind of like somebody who was disconnected from the normal process and, because work is so entwined with my identity in a lot of ways, kind of what you were talking about a little bit, Brett, um, uh, you know, I, it, for me, it's not anything to do with my, my, my mental health or, or my neurodivergency, but work has for better or worse been like a, a big definer of, of how I kind of see myself, um, uh, probably for worse, to be honest, it was, it was interesting to be back in kind of a, a place and be like, Oh, this isn't necessarily my identity anymore. Um, but you know, you still have like this muscle memory of being able to kind of jump in and, and 
do yeah. it and uh you know um you know bullshit and ask some of the the questions if you need to about stuff that like i don't think about every day anymore right so uh, is it muscle memory because i i watch some of the stuff you do mm -hmm. and like when we do this podcast if we're having a rough day we can come on and we can say i'm having a rough day it's gonna yep. be it's gonna be slow i'm i'm super tired you don't get to do that no. when you are presenting no no, like, are you no. able to just flip a switch yeah. and just be on? Because yeah. I, I have trouble imagining that for myself. Yeah, I, I am. And that actually, that's actually, thank you for bringing it back for the mental health thing. That is a struggle because, and this is what I think people don't understand sometimes about those types of roles, because you have to be on. And not only are you on when the camera's on, you need to be on when you're not on, you know, because you need to be mm -hmm. nice to the crew and the execs. And then if you're going to the community meetups and the other things that are happening around these things, you have to be on there too. Like I was commiserating with um, a former colleague of mine and we were talking about like a lot of people are like, oh, you know, your spouse would never go on these trips with you. And I'm like, well, it's not a vacation, right? Like if if he came at the end of the trip on his own dime and then we I took time off and we stayed a few extra days in the city, yeah. sure. But when you go to these things – yeah, you might have a day or two that you can get around to do sightseeing, but it is not a vacation. And beyond that, even when you have those little pockets you can carve out for yourself, you still have to be on at all times. Mm -hmm. And it can be really draining. And I consider myself a social person, right? Like I consider myself an extrovert, but it can still be really draining. And then in a scenario like this, when you're doing the the hosting stuff, we are live. There are some pre-records. Um, but even those, they like to do them in one shot, but we are live and, and you have like a camera crew and you can't just mess up. If you do, you've got to kind of joke at yourself and then move on. But like, it is the same as doing like live television where you've got to be on, you've got to have the energy. It doesn't matter that you, you know, woke up at four 30 in the morning and have been there since, you know, 6am. And, um, this is your third day in a row of doing a 12 hour day and you're exhausted, like you've got to, you've got to look and have the energy and bring it on and, and do this stuff. And you don't have any way to not do it. And so I think a lot of people, they think, oh, it must be so easy. You're just reading off a teleprompter. I was like, no, it's actually not. It's both emotionally and mentally. There's a lot that goes into it. And then beyond that, like not everybody has the personality type for it. Uh, and, and, and not everybody would enjoy doing it. And I do enjoy doing it, but when I do it like days like this, like a day after I'm coming off of like a three day bender where I'm just like, fuck, mm, you know, yeah. I'm after we finish doing overtired, like, and I finish uploading the latest episode to the download to, uh, to YouTube and, and get that up. Like, I'm just going to like take an edible and like peace out for the rest of the weekend. Have you seen the show, uh, reboot? No, no. Um, it's, it's got, Keegan Michael Key in it. I can't oh, okay. name the Love rest him. of the actors, but you would know all of them. Okay, uh, it's got the jackass dude, uh, like Johnny the main Knoxville? jackass dude, Johnny Knoxville, Knoxville. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's just there's a moment where she has just received like very troubling personal news, and then they call, like she's on, and she has to walk from. It's about it's about a TV show. It's okay. about a Hulu Hulu TV show, and okay. like she's backstage, and all of a sudden it's her it's her time for a line, and she has to drop from this like extremely emotional moment, like of like anger and sadness, and just smile and walk out into a sitcom television yep. set, yep. and deliver her line. And I'm like that that remind it made me think of you, Christina, because I know you go through some shit. I know Absolutely. like no, life is not perfect for you, but when no. you get in front of the camera, you have to smile and you got to be on. And and yeah. I thought of you. Yeah, no, I once, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, I mean, I, I, I would not look and, and all fairness, I would not have been able to do this if, if it had been like my own, um, uh, you know, uh, parent or father or anything. But like I was, um, I just, um, arrived in Paris, I think when, um, my, uh, my husband's father, when my father-in-law died. Like I had just arrived mm, wow. and, and he'd, he'd been sick. He had cancer. Grant was with him and I literally had just arrived and that happened. And I was not in a position where I could fly back. It was not one of yeah. those things where I, I, you know, it just, it, it wasn't like it, I was not in a position where I could do that. And then like, you have to go and give a talk and, and be hanging out with people 
forgetting about the fact that like you have all these other stresses happening in your life and at home and these personal things and it can't matter. It's exactly like you said, like you, you know, you, you could be feeling really sick. You could be feeling whatnot. Like I, I passed out on stage once my blood sugar got bad and I fainted on stage with, and that was really fucking embarrassing. And then you oh, have to man. like build it up and go on and then pretend like, like, no, no, don't make anything about me. I think people gave me really good review marks because they felt bad for me, but that was uh, <laughs> still like, you know, humiliating on a lot of levels. It was not great. Um, but yeah, that's, you're exactly right. It's, 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 um, Yeah. It can be a lot. And and I think that that's why I, after I do a lot of these things, when I did them more frequently, it was easier to kind of figure out how to kind of like modulate, you know, and kind of get through it. But then when it's like been a while and like, I haven't done one of these all day things in quite some time. Like I, I was at, um, get merged, but that was an in-person thing. And it's just, it's not the same as on camera. It's not the same. And, um, you know, it's, it's not the same as when you literally have like a, a full production studio and like a jib coming at you and four cameras and instructions in your ears of where you need to turn and what you need to do and reading off the prompter and you've got to get in at this timeline and oh, now you're being told that you have to actually extend two minutes because they need to fill time. And so you're talking <laughs> to someone and you're like, all right, let's, we're, we're, we're going to have to like come up with an extra talk point. going to vamp for two minutes. Yeah. yeah, which I can do. But the, the problem is, is that sometimes the person you're vamping with doesn't know they have to vamp. Like I was doing a, an interview live <laughs> yesterday about some security stuff and the girl was great, but we'd rehearsed a lot and she was wanting to be very specific and, and very scripted in what she did, which I totally get because for people who don't do this for a living, like they feel much more comfortable when they have it all out there. Um, but it needed to be five minutes. And originally when we practiced, it was like seven. So we needed to cut two minutes. Well, we cut too much or she cut too much. Um, and so we had a minute to go. And so we're done and I need to be kind of wrapping up. And she and I hadn't talked about this before, but I was like, okay, I have, to, I have, you know, literally I have, I have 65 seconds I need to fill. So I have to like come up on the fly with another question. She handled it great. She gave some great tips. It was fine. And then I was able to get us out. I think we might've still been about 10 seconds early, but we were, you know, close enough, but yeah, you're right. Like those things happen and it's just like, okay, that's, that, that's it. And you have to forget about all the other shit that might be going on in the back of your mind. And I'm sorry, that was a rant, but I'm very tired. So I'm no, that was babbling. great. Oh, but it sounds exhausting. Yeah, for real. <laughs> it, no, it is. Um, it is. I'm going to, I would like to tell you about Amazon pharmacy though. Ooh, oh, thanks. Please. That's nice. That's of you. I feel like I feel like it's a good segue after mental health. We all mm. we all get meds. We all have to go to the drugstore. So when I need to go to the drugstore, I always seem to wait until the last minute, hoping they'll be open or Same. I get stuck in a line. Right. Or both. And that's why I love Amazon Pharmacy. Yes, that Amazon. Amazon Pharmacy delivers a better pharmacy experience that delivers directly to your door and works on most insurance plans. Amazon Pharmacy helps you save time, save money, and stay healthy. There's transparent pricing so you know what you'll pay before you pay it, and that's great. Prime members can save up to 80% on their prescriptions, and like I mentioned before, Amazon Pharmacy works with most insurance plans. And check this out. If you ever have any questions or problems, real pharmacists are always available at Amazon Pharmacy, no matter what time of day or night. Your medication gets delivered to your door, so there's no more rushing out to the drugstore, hoping to get there before they close. A pharmacy that works for your life with meds delivered to your door. It doesn't get any better than that. Switch to Amazon Pharmacy and save time, save money, and stay healthy. Learn more at Amazon.com slash overtired. That's Amazon.com slash overtired. Average savings based on usage inside RX data as compared to cash prices. Average savings for all generics are 78%, 37% for select brand medications. Restrictions apply. That's Amazon.com slash overtired. Thanks, Amazon. I, those are words I I'm not used to uttering. Thanks, Amazon. Is, is there oh, anything? Well. Was there anything in the ad script that indicated how you were supposed to say the words "yes, comma that Amazon"? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, comma that Amazon. Do we want to go ahead and do our our next uh, ad read too? Just go ahead and and uh, yeah. get them over. Brett, you had mentioned reboot, um, and I'm not sure what network that's on. Um, if that's a if that's Hulu or Netflix, it's a Hulu or, show. 
Yeah. Okay, it's a Hulu show. Okay, well, that's actually interesting. I mean, at this point, Hulu is more available internationally. However, there are some weird differences. Like if you're in the UK, like it might be part of Disney Plus. If you're like in other things, it might may or may not work. We also see things, uh, you know, we were just talking about that Amazon and some Amazon Prime stuff varies country by country. The same with, with Netflix stuff. And, uh, you know, if you're ever in that scenario where like you're really excited to watch this show or film and then you find out it's not available in your country and that's really frustrating. Um, and in, uh, in before times when I used to travel all the time, that was always frustrating. But with NordVPN, I can switch my virtual location on my device with one click and I can access streaming services from over 60 countries at no extra cost. And that opens up a Pandora's box of entertaining content that I wouldn't be able to access without NordVPN which is really great. And uh, certainly it's also, I point out if you're in your home country and you want to enjoy foreign content in some of those regions, a lot of times it's really good and really weird. And that's a fun thing to do. <laughs> so you've probably heard that VPNs are great for online protection, but they slow down your internet speed. And that is honestly like a, a common complaint uh, with, uh, with VPNs is that like the latency between where the node is and where you are can, can mean that stuff is slow. However, NordVPN is the fastest VPN in the world. Um, I don't even notice when it's running, and I'm actually saying that genuinely. I've used it, and uh, you, the, the latency is actually remarkably uh, good. And um, so you can stream and browse online with no buffering or lagging. That's especially important with online video because that is delivering you know, a, a lot of data to you. So if, if it's going to be throttling or, or, or laggy, then it's not a great experience. And gaming. And game, for gaming, gamers. Uh, yeah, yeah. For for gamers, that's all. Gamers is an even bigger issue. Um, but NordVPN, um, you know, basically helps prevent your internet service from bandwidth throttling, so you've got a, a reliable internet connection. It's basically the the price of a cup of coffee every month, which can be a small price to pay for premium cybersecurity and access to a vast amount of entertaining content from all over the world. You can get your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com slash overtired. Get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan and you get four months for free. So that's like a quarter of a year for free. Uh, it's completely, or a third of a year for free. <laughs> right. Um, it's, it's, it's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day uh, money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash overtired. nordvpn.com slash overtired. Go grab this amazing deal and start surfing securely. Again, nordvpn.com slash overtired. Have you guys seen Heartbreak High? No. Tell us about it. You know what? You know I have a thing for young adult stuff. Yes. Some of my favorite books are classified as YA. Okay, and, yeah, why well, for sure. That's that's different and I though. Don't, but yeah. I well, yeah, and this is and it's not I think I might be emotionally stunted from years of of addiction. Um but I really I really enjoy YA stuff. But L, who does not have my history with addiction, also enjoys this show called Heartbreak High on Netflix. And it is astounding. It is like if you are queer or neurodivergent in any way, this show has something for you. It Ooh, is. Oh, and it's a reboot. Is it really? It is. Apparently, I'm, it was an Australian program that, that also aired on the BBC. Um, from That's funny because this t still takes place in Australia. Yeah, well, no, that makes sense because it'd be weird for them to like reboot it otherwise. But yeah, it was on it was on Network Ten um, and um, and then it was on BBC Two. But yeah, it was it was so it was an Australian show. It was uh, oh, show, it's, it's a spinoff of the 1993 Australian feature film, The Heartbreak Kid. They um, need to see the original now because yeah. this show is Tell so heartfelt. It. Okay, um, like you, like the the main characters. Are there's one girl who who's basically neurotypical, uh, has no idea what's going on in her friends' lives. Um, like she's very surface level, but then her friends include like uh, a non-binary queer, like uh, like cis male um, who is in love with this guy who's caught up in this like. Uh, world of crime where he basically is scared to deviate because he'll get the shit beat out of him. You got an autistic girl and, and he's best friends with the autistic girl and is like an amazing friend to a high school girl with autism. 
and there's uh uh you got a, a girl who goes through um a near sexual assault and then her father is also uh insane i don't know in what way but basically her life is in danger at home because her father her single father is just fucking nuts and like all of this comes together it is the most dramatic high school center it's like if 902 and O had a lot more just insanity and neurodivergence to it okay so so so, so is australian degrassi is what you're saying <laughs> I, I don't actually relate to that that analogy but i'm gonna i'm gonna yes. let it i'm gonna accept that that's probably true okay so 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 degrassi and then there was degrassi so there's degrassi junior high degrassi high then there was degrassi the next generation and then they did a netflix one and i don't fucking know what that's called and they might be doing another one but it's like this canadian soap teen soap thing that has gone on for generations that uh that's where we got drake from to be honest okay because uh. drake was on the next generation he was he was a uh, jimmy brooks who got shot and then uh crippled he was a basketball player who was shot in a school shooting thing and and then uh couldn't use his legs anymore and um and they ver- they let him rap occasionally but you didn't ever actually hear any of his stuff then he was always kind of doing it on the down low um under his uh his drake uh moniker but uh <laughs> It, it sounds a lot like Heartbreak High seems like Australian Degrassi, which as a big fan of Degrassi, um, I'm here for. So yeah, that's fun. I awesome. I reckon I don't think I don't think it's it's specifically for people who enjoy young adult stuff. I think it's for anyone who is neurodivergent or queer in any way that wants characters that can relate to you because they do an amazing job. Mm-hmm. of representing different types of people. That's um, great. It's it's really like it's really moving. I recommend it for everyone. That's cool. Yeah, and actually it turns out some of the characters that I'm just looking at here some of the the recurring and notable guest stars um were from the original. So, um I wonder Oh, I didn't if, know that uh, at yeah. all. Yeah. We, we no again, so again, I, I'm I'm just being real like and I'm into watching this because I was unaware of this show. But this does completely scream to me. And in, and in fact, I bet even when it was created, because Degrassi had already happened in Canada, um, at, I totally bet that somebody was just like, let's just do an Australian version of Degrassi. Uh, and uh, which is genius. You should totally do that. And now the reboot um, is referencing old things like Degrassi did. So I'm, I'm going to watch this. And I, yeah. I think to your point, I think it's great that they show like these different types of people. But I also feel like whether you're emotionally stunted or not, and I love your thoughts on this, Jeff, because you're, you know, you have, um, teenagers, but I feel like Mm -hmm. there's something kind of for a lot, for some people, not everybody, but for some people, there's something that is like always going to be fun and relatable. And, you know, like you can jump into things that are either take place at that time in people's lives or, um, you know, things that may or may not be classified as YA just because even though, whether you're emotionally centered or not, once you get past that, we can always, I think a lot of us anyway, can like go back and like, remember, what that time was like. And, and that's just like a, it can be very compelling is all I'm saying. Like, I think whether or not you, cause I don't consider myself emotionally stunted the way that, that you might Brett, but <laughs> I've loved teen shows since before I was a teenager. Long, long after I was a teen, you know, I like YA stuff. Um, but I also think that sometimes it can also be a really good way, as you were mentioning to showcase people, with with different backgrounds and um you know um uh you know who are different because it's a lot easier to kind of show that kind of coming of age stuff in a coming of age setting than it is in like an adult workplace thing where you know it's like people like even um, the 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 most uh uh you know understanding and, and and whatnot amongst us like you might not give the same sort of understanding or care as much about the journey if it's like watching like a a workplace you know, drama of somebody in their forties and going through these things as if you're seeing like the self-discovery and, and yeah, and exactly. Whatnot, like you know? that, that moment, that chrysalis when, uh, when things like neurodivergence become like the most important in your life, right. uh, the, th- the times when they affect your life the most, yeah. like everyone who grew up, uh, you know, a bipolar, autistic, ADHD, 
We all remember depressed. Yeah. We remember what high school was like. Yep. Uh, those times when it became the forefront of our lives. Yeah. Uh, and I think everybody, no matter where they're at, can remember those moments. I agree. And I feel like high school dramas, uh, they they work. They do. At any age. They do. High school dramas, young adult things. I mean, I think that's why like some of the best films and some of those things like I consider The Graduate like one of like the best yeah. films of all time, right? And and um, you know, based on a book, but like Mark Mike Nichols, like what he did with that, like that is like the the kind of quintessential of that era coming of age thing. It's also sort of an allegory for the end of that decade of the '60s, right? And mm-hmm. um, and I think you know you, you see that with a lot of a lot of content, and and that I think is why YA stuff is read at this point more by adults than than young adults, right? Like if anything, that makes me I, feel better. No, no, no. This has been the trend for at least a decade. Like, oh it, yeah, it, for it, sure. Like, like Twilight was definitely part of the kickoff for sure. But then, like Hunger Games, I think was really. I mean, Harry Potter. Honestly, if we really want to go back, but that I don't <laughs> consider Harry Potter or YA. I think those are children's books um, that happen to just be very good. But then you had yeah. Twilight, and then you really had Hunger Games because Hunger Games, the books were fucking good, and it wasn't just like a book that you would be like, Oh, these are just things that kids read. It was like, no, this is actually like a good series. And then sure. the movies were really fucking good. Like the, the movies were better than they had any right to be. Right. Yeah. And, and that kicked off, I think this whole resurgence of, um, writers, especially from different backgrounds, writing for frankly adult audiences, but using the YA themes. And I'm sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm rambling cause I'm tired. No, I feel like that's totally no. true. Like I, f- those books are not like, they're not, stupid no like they're not written to children they are written to adults yes uh and they might be about themes that maybe a high schooler can relate to yep but but i'm i'm not a stupid guy no and no you're not i read these books i'm very literate and i read these books and like they speak to me maybe not in the way that like a tom robbins book speaks to me but uh, but I never feel like it's being dumbed down or like I'm reading something for children. It, like they are, they're written for adults about, about themes that honestly we've all been through and exactly. we can relate to. Totally. Did either of you ever read um, The Perks of Being a Wallflower? No. No. Okay. So it's a great film too. Um, and and Stephen um, Shablowski can't pronounce his last name or can't think of it, but he, um, I think he wrote the screenplay as well as uh, the book, which for, for me, like made it really good, but it, it, so it was published in 1999. I was in high school. I was like the, the age it was really kind of designed for. Um, I'd read Catcher in the Rye right before I read that. And, and that actually was going to be one of the examples I used to Catcher in the Rye is a fucking YA novel. It's a coming of age novel, right? Yeah, but it's also yeah, widely sure. considered one of the greatest books of all time. And it is right. But, but that is like one of those, but Perks of Being a Wallflower um, it takes place, it's written through letters to this kind of anonymous person and it takes place in, I think like 1991. Um, and, um, uh, which was an interesting device even to use then because for the generation, like my generation who read it, like I kind of knew some of the references, but I didn't know the Smiths. Like I was, I'll I'll be completely honest. I was introduced to the Smiths through the perks of being a wallflower because in the book he, he talks about getting these tapes and, and listening to the song, um, um, you know, asleep and, um, and things like that. And like that introduced me to, to the Smiths. Um, and then I remember going using Napster to like download songs that were in the, in, in the, um, book Napster. and then later in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that is one of those, like, I was just, I would just put it out there for anybody who likes this sort of stuff. It's a fantastic book. The film is great too. The film has, um, Emma Watson and, um, um, Ezra Miller, uh, who they are, you know, controversial, but they were very good actors in it. And, um, Logan Lerman, it's it's uh it was um adapted in 2012 and was uh very well received um as as a film. But the the book is I still think back in my mind is like, yeah, it would be probably my top ten books, as like like weird as that is for a fucking MTV book because it was under MTV's imprint, which was brand new was then. It? Yeah. Wow. It was it, it, MTV books was brand new then it was under their imprint. And I remember even reading the the reviews, like I don't remember if it was the Times or or you know, things like that, but it, you know, it was written up in, in some of like the things other than Kirkus who were like, Oh, this is actually good. And, you know, it came out in paperback. It was one of those like great just books. And anyway, it just makes me think of that because you're right, those things are 
like forever or whatnot. And I was the age um, that I needed to be when that came out. But as an adult, I could still think like people could read that and watch the film and totally be like, this shit works. And then it's interesting because the film, what I liked about it, they didn't um, adjust the timeline. It still took place in the early 1990s. So mm. even though at that point it was it was 20 years later or 30 years later, 20 years later. Yeah. Hmm. Can you drop hmm. that in the show notes? I will Park, absolutely put that Park in the show notes. Sa- Savini? Uh, yes. Can I throw two shows into that mix? Please yeah. do. Uh, Dairy Girls and Sex Education. Yes. Both yes. I love Dairy Girls. Ugh. Both. We're, I love Sex Education. I'm so great. excited. There's another season it's coming. Fantastic. <laughs> Such a great show. So fantastic. I, I, know, just, it's like for I me, just restarted Dairy Girls uh, this week, too. Oh, nice. We've started season three, uh, which just came out. Um, yeah, and that's why I restarted. I had to yeah. like, I had to start from the beginning so I could get season three in. But yeah, great so, shows. So delightful. You know, one of a, a man who was kind of a, a boy who was kind of a bully in my high school, uh, kind of stated something once to me that to me is like explains my attraction to any kind of media that takes us back into our sort of mid to late adolescence. He said to me, and this guy was such a jerk. He, he used to punch me at the bus stop once we were in the computer lab and he balled up a bunch of clay from, from a uh, pottery class and he threw it at the back of my neck as hard as he could. He's such a dick. And then one day he says to me, he's like, you know what, you know what high school is? This is all high school. High school is just a microcosm of the rest of the world. And I went, <laughs> where do you get off dropping fucking wisdom on me like <laughs> like but and he's completely I accurate that, Fuck. and i thought of that motherfucker ever since <laughs> it's just like but it's true like you know it's like for me also like there's always a, a film projector playing like uh you know not quite in focus reels of my high school experience inside yes. my head you know yes. like we're always i feel like we're always living there a little bit um and, and so i think to be able to like touch it through literature and TV is just awesome. Sex education for me, especially, was one of those. Yeah, I just I, yeah, throw sex in. education is great. Sorry, go on. Ugh. I really, I thought Christina was saying Parks, Savini, Wallflower, and I'm no. just looking at the show notes and realizing that's, that's her saying, password. That's her. The, that's her Google. That's password. my password. The indeed. perks, the, <laughs> the perks <laughs> of being a wallflower, which I have actually heard of. That's way less for it. <laughs> Okay, yeah, because okay. I was a little bit surprised. I was like, the "Perks of Being a Wallflower," <laughs> the the movie and the the book. I mean, the book is is um is is fairly acclaimed. And I was especially, I, I was like, it was written by like a, a late era Gen Xer, like a guy, uh, you know, about your age, um, Brett, uh, uh, because he he wrote it based on like when he was in high school, yeah. and um and so I you know um yeah anyway it, it's a it's 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 a it's a great book. Um, sex education. Sex education uh, is great too. Uh, Scully is amazing in sex education. Scully. <laughs> What's Jillian her name? Anderson. Jillian Anderson. Yes. Yeah, yeah, she's amazing. It's incredible. If she's if so... nobody's seen it, it's the it, and it's, her it, lover, it, the Lars yes, or whatever his name yes. is. He, it's such a great relationship. I just love the those idea two. that you've got a high school kid whose mom is a is a sex therapist. He <laughs> yeah. has he has all the possible repression issues, and he ends up being a counselor to people right. in his school in a secret spot to help them with their most most intimate sexual problems. Uh-huh. And it's like, and I just think, I mean, what a beautiful premise in the first place. But yep. just the way it unfolds is just yep. amazing, amazing. It's so good. Anyway. <laughs> Should Love we uh, should we do some gratitude before we wrap up? Yeah, sure. I'm gonna go with Choosy this week. There are there are multiple apps. Like so, basically, it, when you click a link, it opens your default browser. Uh, but if you have Choosy set as your default browser, instead of your default browser, you get a a window, mm-hmm. a little like pop up where you can choose like Safari or Chrome or Firefox or Edge or whatever, whatever browsers you have installed. And you can pick which, which uh, app to open any link in. Mm -hmm. What I love about Choosy and Choosy is honestly, it's the oldest one I know that still exists. It's been around for a while and it's still updated. Um, What I love is that it has a whole uh, rules system 
where you can say, if this is true, then open in this browser or offer me a selection of these particular browsers. And you I can have that. like default so browsers bad. for yep. certain types of links. If yes. I hold down the option key and click a link in an email, it'll ask me which browser to open it in. Uh, if it's an Oracle specific link that I know is going to require the VPN, I send it to Safari. I don't yep. have to think about it. It just automatically opens in Safari where my VPN works better. Um, and just like all of these things that as the problem arises, I just add a new rule and I never have to think about it again. And Choosy, Choosy is perfect for it. Yeah, I, I will plus one that. I'll also say uh, Choosy, um, George, who is the, the developer of Choosy, he actually works at GitHub, which um, I uh, realized slash remembered a few months um, a after I joined and I like reached out to him and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, because we, we've been Twitter mutuals, but I, I uh, never really talked to him that much. And I was like, oh, that's awesome that we're both at, at GitHub. Um, and uh, I, I, so it's funny. So I use Choosy on... I think two of my machines. I have been trying one called, I think it's pronounced Velha. It's V-E-L-J-A. Yeah. yeah. And that's from um, um that. and that's from Sindra Sorhas, who's a, a very uh, we've talked about a lot of um uh, his apps before. That one's in the app store, it's free. Choosy is good and because, open source, yeah. And open source, yes. Choosy is good because I think that it's a little bit more customizable in terms of some of the rules you can do. And mm -hmm. in terms of, um, like, like you said, like getting like specific apps and like, if you want like to really get granular with your rules, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, and I, I love choosy the, the one thing I will say, if you're using a browser that has, uh, different profiles, like Chrome has profiles, but so does edge. So does like Chrome beta, whatnot. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you use like a bunch of the, those different types of things and you want to open specific sites and a specific profile, Choosy right now doesn't do that for yeah. all of the um, uh, various like versions of of the browser. So you might want to look at at Velha. But um, in general, I totally agree with you. Like it's such a great app, and and it's one of those that I paid for a million years ago. I remember when it was a preference pane, and then it became like its own app, and mm -hmm. it's so, it's yep. so good. <laughs> totally. Like I can't I can't not use those things because for me. I'm similar to you, right? Like if, if I'm doing work stuff and I even have like a rule set up, like in choosing and whatnot, like if I'm opening something up in GitHub, it needs to be in my work profile in yep. Chrome because that's where all my stuff is. And that's where I'm authenticated yep. through like Okta in terms of like my um, fingerprint key, because I only have so many of them and I, you know, can send everything there. But for other stuff, it might be like, no, I want to use edge or I want to use Safari or, you know, Firefox well, or whatever yeah, the case I, may be. And I have the, uh, I have the choosy plugin installed in Firefox, Chrome and Safari, where if I'm viewing a web page in one browser and I mm -hmm. like as a web developer, I want to see how this page looks in another browser. I just click the choosy button in the toolbar and pick a different browser and it opens the same page and it or if I go to something like Riverside where we record yep. our podcast and I forget which browser I'm in, I can just click the button and switch yep. to Chrome, nice. which it requires. Yep. Um I've also played with browser fairy, but honestly, choosy is choosy's my choice. I yeah. choose choosy. Yeah, I would say I, I I like Choosy and I I like um Velha, but yeah, Choosy is 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 great and it's well designed and and George does uh good work and uh, also you know shout out to another uh, GitHub um coworker, but I've been using it for I don't even know how long, but yeah, great great pick. All right, that's it for me. Oh wait wait wait, wait one thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you know I added Chrome pro profiles to Bunch? No. Ooh, tell so us about that because that's, that's in, awesome. Yeah. In bunch, in bunch, you can open a, a link specifically in Chrome just by typing Chrome colon and then putting the URL. Now, if you type Chrome and then in square brackets, you specify a profile uh, and it's case insensitive. It'll take the first match um, and you can specify any profile and bunch will open that link automatically in that specific profile it only works with chrome and canary right now um i haven't played with edge uh incorporating it there but but you can you can do specific chrome profiles in bunch Very cool. what about um like firefox um containers do those yeah, have an api I attached to them at all i've not figured that out yet no okay okay i'll be right here when you do <laughs>
You want to go, Christina? Sure. All right. So um, the one I'm going to mention, um, there are a bunch of uh, these types of apps, and 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 uh, I know that, like we talk a lot about note taking things, and Brett obviously is working on his own thing, but. Um, you know, the second brain kind of like uh, era of apps, you know, has been a thing for a few years. Like there's LogSec, there's Roam Research, and there's Obsidian. And Obsidian 1.0 just came out. Like they just hit 1.0 and they actually had a, a pretty decent redesign. I think, the, I think the app looks a lot better. And um, although I do wish that it were maybe open source, most of the um, plugins are. And so there is like a really um, great ecosystem. They have a way that you can pay either one off or if you want to do the subscription, I don't do any of their subscriptions because I don't care anything about publishing from them. There are other ways you could do it too. And and the syncing through iCloud uh, works uh, perfectly fine for me. But I think that in terms of like the, so the idea of this is it's not just like a notes app because you could have any notes app. It's like a notes app and a mind mapper and you can grab things from other sources. Like you can get plugins with, you know, different reading sources or, you know, um, different things you can send to, and it can extract stuff from images and, and tweets and other files and, and really um, make it so that you kind of have your own personal wiki to then be able to search through and find things really easily. I have multiple things to say about Obsidian. Okay. Uh, first of all, Early in their development, they contacted me uh, for advice on some various markdown kinds of things. And, and they said, we don't see this as a, as a, a competitor to the, the NV Ultra app that you've announced that you're working on and have been for fucking years now. Um, I'm like, absolutely, it is. Of course it but is. But I, I 100% want to help you out because, sure. you know. This is the community we work in. Right. Um, and absolutely it is. Of it, course is, it is. It absolutely is hundred percent a competitor to NV Ultra. And it is a fantastic application. Um, the things it can do, the extensibility of it, the the way it can do these like mind map node connections of all your notes. I can't remember what they call it, but it's it's outstanding. Um there are you they have a URL. Uh, handler and uh, you can create like I have incorporated obsidian into gather my tool for markdownifying any web oh, page did? Um, not so basically I incorporated gather with NV ultra and then realized I could just create uh, a way to generate URL handlers for any application uh, with it, with Obsidian in mind, but I made it more flexible so you could make it work with any URL handler. Uh, but if you go to the the Gather Wiki, uh, basically I made it so you can take any web page and Markdownify it straight to an Obsidian note. Oh, that's and badass. incorporate it into your wiki uh, oh, yeah. with one click using a shortcut. Um, yeah, Obsidian is outstanding. It's just like I can't it's compete amazing. with Obsidian. It's so good. It's amazing. I use it actually, the way I use it is I have a single folder of my text files and it's also an Obsidian vault and it's also mm -hmm. the default folder that NV Ultra goes to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's also That's the, the beauty of it. That is it's the beauty also, of it. Yeah. Flat it's also down where, storage. It's perfect. Speaking of Brett tools, it's also where all of my quick question uh, yeah. text files are. Uh -huh. and, and, and that helps a great deal because I still, I, I, it is a competitor clearly, but I see why they would why they would believe maybe more strongly than they ought to that it's not right because you um, can use them in tandem. Though, you can. So are, no complaints. Yeah, exactly. That, I've always said, I know I've said that to you a hundred times when we talk about Obsidian, it's like, well, I actually kind of use them both. But, no. Yeah. Oh, I was uh, going to say, yeah. th and I use them differently. Right. And like they, they are absolutely competitors, but I think what's great about this stuff and, and the knowledge, I mean, and you know this better than anybody, Brett, these things are so specific and personal like mm -hmm. you, you cannot make this the sort of thing where like you, you can't design programs like this, in my opinion, anyway, and be like, this is going to be the one app that everyone is going to use. Right. Or you shouldn't. You, know, you shouldn't think that. Well, you shouldn't think that way. <laughs> and if you do think that way, it, it will not be successful with the, right. the, the, the nerdy, like very granular, customizable audience. Right. Yeah. Like if, if yeah. you want to do a general notes app, that's fine. But that's yeah. not going to have all these types of features. And if you so, want to make if you want to make a craft, if you want to become right. your own ecosystem, sure, go for it. Sure. But if you want to if you want to appeal to the 
And be ultra Obsidian customers, you need to be open format. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And so that's what I do like about Obsidian is that even though like it's not open source, like the vaults, like you said, it's just flat markdown files. So you can use them together. And a lot of people do. Like I I frequently Mm -hmm. use multiple things together. Yeah, I I do too. (laughs) And and, and, and because there are certain use cases where it's better, right? Like I think in terms of ingesting certain data, like Obsidian because of its plugin ecosystem is better. But if I was trying to do maybe I wanted to get really great markdown formatting and, and, and do kind of different types of writing, right? Like, like hot, MV Ultra hot key fit. access to quick, take a quick note. Yeah. Right. That's where MV Ultra fits in. Exactly. But as far as like linking your notes together right. and that's making not really... a real wiki, all of that, that's, that's beyond scope for MV Ultra and right. perfect for Obsidian. They've right. done such a good job with it. Exactly. But, but like you said, you can use them together, but yes, obviously they are competitors, right? Obviously, there, I think the core most active user base will use more than one, but yeah, you know what I mean. Like if you're going after kind of the general person, yeah, obviously they're 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 yeah, it could better. But but I'm really glad that you added all those features. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to congrats <laughs> them on on one My pick is the is an app I used for like years ago, and just picked back up, which is Shortcat. And what Shortcat does? Oh my does, god! I haven't heard of that. I haven't heard about Shortcat. Is, like at it least essentially, 10 years. it essentially allows you with a she- keyboard shortcut to basically select any UI function oh, um, to yeah. search and select any UI function in the app you're in. Um, many more features in a browser, but like if I'm, you know, I the thing I think of is that Brett has the misfortune of having to sometimes talk me through something I'm doing on a screen share and, and he'll be like, no, no, I told you, no, it's up there. No, it's up. It's up. It's up. <laughs> up over left, up, left, up, left, further up, over. Up, up, nope. Um, and what you can do is shortcut <laughs> cut, shortcut is just hit your, you know, glo- global shortcut and uh, type in the thing he said I was supposed to be hitting. And then you can even click from there. Um, it's just a really, I, I don't even know, like uh, it's, it's, totally uh has great functionality that i don't use very often but it is one of those things when i first discovered this app that kind of made me understand how how you are able to interface with your computer in ways that are invisible to you um and the fact that you could be in an app and just start typing and it would it would show you functionality that you can't even see right right Um, yeah it's deep (laughs) access it's deep access to mac os accessibility um, yep. features and it uses accessibility to be able to access any control you can see on screen um and provide yep. keyboard shortcuts to it it's it's an outstanding i just haven't heard about it for years that's well, all right re- no same was, i had it was it was rewritten it looks like um a big rewrite happened in like june or july so oh, now really? there's oh, been yeah interesting. so so this is what happened yeah so i'm because i just i had i'd heard of it but i forgot all about it so i looked this up and in um June 27th, 2022, first release from scratch rewrite with improved architecture and interface, requires Mac OS 11 plus, some workflows have changed, new UI, and then they've started adding, it's been actively developed, like a, like a new release just came out. Do you think they, did they rewrite it in Swift? Did they rewrite it in Swift? Do you think? I don't know. Okay. Probably. Huh. But, but I, but, well, I, but I don't the, know. The funny thing is the reason it came up for me was not that, it was that um, I'm, I'm trying to just like deal with the garbage pile that my Synology is of all of my old files. Cause I dumped them all in there and I was just trying to see if I could find, make some sense of it. And I found a folder that had all my apps from a backup from like 20, I don't know what, I mean, I think I, I might be crazy, but I'm pretty sure shortcut came into my life in, before 2010. Yeah, no, I could be wrong. It was a long. No, yeah, no, no, I know. I, yes. Yeah, no, I look back at it. I think, I think it. I think the first one that I see, but this was not the first version on their page, goes back to 2012, and so, okay. and that was uh, version 0.2.3, but that means before 2010 probably does make sense, right? So yeah, it, yeah. It, but that just that, but but no, because I I vaguely remembered the app, but I didn't. I hadn't thought about it in a long time. I don't know if I ever used it, but yeah, it just got a significant rewrite and now it looks like it is actually under much more active development, which is really cool. Yeah, think, it's awesome. It's fun I, for not using your mouse. <laughs> I think I've mentioned it on the show before, but have you guys seen Paletro? No. Uh, I think it's available I, you, through Setup. Right. Yeah. You've told me about this one before. 
so if you're familiar do? with the command shift p palette in in sublime or vs code if you have sublime yeah. shortcuts um it gives you access to every menu item in an application just by hitting command shift p in any app oh uh, wow. so you can type command shift p and then just like right. fuzzy matching of any menu item uh hit return next time you pop it up it will default to the last uh, menu item you triggered oh so slick. it makes it really easy to repeat functionality uh i'm gonna add it to the show notes just absolutely bonus pick Poletro. Bonus pick Poletro. yeah i actually it's funny because i looked at this i just pulled up setup i didn't have it installed on this computer but i have it starred so i clearly have it installed someplace but i might not have used it you know how those things go but um but, <laughs> but like all no meaning i haven't like used it regularly all the time but i do remember totally. this now because you told me about it and that's awesome yeah yeah all it's right it's got the most adorable icon i'm looking i forget what <laughs> it's a little kitten with a with a computer mouse in its mouth oh you're talking about uh uh short cat short cat yeah. yeah okay not poletro poletro's icon sorry is super not Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say, but yeah, shortcuts icon is super, super cute. But uh, yeah, Pletros yeah. is is a little more normal, um, not not super cute, but sounds like a great app. So yeah, add that as a bonus. But yeah, shortcut. Thank you for that. I'm gonna play with this. Yeah, super fun. All right, you guys. All right, get some sleep, Jeff. I I wish you the best of luck. Um, well, thank you. We love you. All of the things that are going on in your life. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, seriously, Jeff, like we love you. Thank you for, for being on the show today and contributing and everything. And uh, um, yeah, uh, YouTube, right? I'm glad you're working through the stuff you're working through. And I'm, I I love you both. And I guess uh, everybody should get Aww. some sleep, right? But yeah. I do. I love I do. you both too. Yeah. Let's get some sleep. Get some sleep. The system is going down low. Hey there, good people. Before you go, we have a bunch of new places where you can interact with us. Please check out our Instagram feed, our YouTube channel, Twitter, of course, and sign up for the Overtired newsletter, which will sort of pick up where the show leaves off with expanded show notes, uh, a little bit of what the three of us get up to between episodes. And let's face it, there'll be some musings. How can you resist musings? You'll find details for all the ways to interact with us in the show notes and at overtired.com. And thank you, thank you, thank you, as always, for listening.